But the two formed solutions that I think we need to pay particular attention to is the dominant solution in terms of carbon trading. Because at, at the philosophical level, at the worldview level, it's the second privatization of the atmospheric commons. The first privatization was putting the pollution into the atmosphere beyond the Earth's recycling capacity. Now with carbon trading, the rights to the Earth's carbon recycling capacity are gravitating exactly into the hands of the polluters. The environmental principle used to be the polluter must pay. Carbon trading is transforming that into the polluter gets paid. Stern, who did the Stern Review, has clearly said it is an allocation of a full set of property rights to the atmosphere. And Price Waterhouse Coopers, who was very notorious in trying to privatize uh, with the World Bank help Delhi's water supply, and we defeated them two years ago in that project, has said that trade in carbon emissions is equated with the transfer of similar rights, such as copyrights, patents, licensing rights, commercial and industrial standards. One of the things we've always said in IFG is the enclosures of the commons is one of the deep crises of resource depletion. Once resources move out of common management and public care, they will get further degraded. And if you really look at some, the clean development mechanism, it's all about dirty industry. It's about HCFC plants uh, being accelerated, new plants being set up in China and India, the biggest recipients of CDM credits in China and India. Are, are plants that are depleting the ozone layer. Spongine plants coming up in the tribal belts of India, in Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and Orissa. Um, and clean seems to have become such a confusing word. We would have thought we know what clean is. And suddenly, everything dirty is clean, <laughs> including nuclear. Nuclear not just as uh, nuclear power, but nuclear as strategic use of nuclear power. I don't know how many of you have followed that the United States signed an agreement with India. Now, it isn't really that the United States signed an agreement with India because you did not sign an agreement and I did not sign that agreement. Yeah. Our Prime Minister came here and the same time they handed over our agriculture to Monsanto, Cargill, and Walmart, who sit on the board of the Agriculture Agreement, they also signed this nuclear agreement, which has led to the Hyde Act. Section 103 of the Hyde Act calls for securing India's full and active participation in US efforts to dissuade, isolate, and if necessary, sanction and contain Iran if it proceeds with its nuclear program. Iran has been mentioned 15 times in a bilateral agreement. So the nuclear agreement with India is definitely not about clean energy. It is about something bigger. And in India, right now, while I'm here, we are having the biggest democratic mobilization against this agreement. First, because parliament did not clear it. Second, because we don't want to be a client state of the empire. We want our non-alignment defended. And thirdly, we don't want a hundred billion dollar market created for the defense industry in the United States. After all, you are going to have a big mobilization tomorrow against the war, and we don't want to be part of US's wars without end. We are, after all, the land of Ghana the land of non-violence, the land of peace, the land of Ahimsa. Uh, as Simon said, we have to begin with solutions where we are. While we defend our democratic rights. I work primarily on agriculture. The globalized, industrialized agriculture is a very big part of the pollution that we are dealing with. A very big part of the crisis we are facing. But ecological, Biodiverse local agriculture is part of the solution, both in reducing emissions, in increasing absorption of carbon, and most importantly, providing the adaptive capacity to deal with climate chaos. 
This year in Navdanya, the movement has started for seed saving. We started saving seeds that can deal with the drought, that can deal with the floods. We've been saving seeds that can deal with the cyclones and hurricanes and distributed those seeds after the tsunami. Um, those seeds are available. They merely have to be saved and distributed rapidly enough before Monsanto comes up with yet another false solution that without genetic engineering and seed patterns, we will not be able to respond to climate change. Um, for those of you who are interested at the South End desk, there is this most recent report I've done, which is very simply soil, not oil. Our solutions for agriculture. And South End also has a, a work that many of us have been involved in, many from IFG, Jerry, Debbie, uh, the International Commission on the Future of Food, and it's the Manifestos on the Future of Seed and Food, and I'm saying this so I don't have to go through all the details that are available in this. I just want to end by saying that we have basically two options. We have the option of letting the remaining resources of the planet be fought over viciously through militarized power. Or we can move rapidly to the ability to rebuild our ecosystems, share the limited resources the planet can provide us, and create good lives while doing it. But to do that, we'll have to get out of many reductionisms. The first reductionism being the reductionism of energy. We suddenly move to thinking of energy only as something we can consume, not as something we generate. And I think that generative concept of energy, we call it Shakti in India, is something we'll have to reclaim because the solution to pollution and wasted people is bringing people back deep into the equation of how we produce things, how we work the land, how we shape community, and how we exercise our democratic rights and rebuild our freedoms. And of course, we have to get out of the mindsets that treat the laws manufactured by the market as immutable and unchanging. And the three concepts that are constantly referred to as something that can't be touched is economic growth. You can't make any change that will touch the 9% growth in India, the 10% growth in China. You cannot interfere in the unregulated market, even though every step of trade liberalization is an interference in the market. Every step of creating an opportunity for Cargill and Monsanto is an interference in the market. And the third false sacred is unbridled consumerism. We are because we buy, something that Jerry uh, addressed. Uh, the problem of climate chaos to me and the prom problem of appropriating the resources of those who need those resources for ecological security and economic security is ultimately a question of ethics and justice. And that issue of ethics and justice can only be addressed if we recognize some very basic facts and reorient our practices of what we eat, what we do on our farms, our homes, our towns, our planet. We need to reimagine our eating and drinking, our moving and working in our local ecosystems and local cultures, enriching our lives while lowering our consumption without impoverishing others. And above all, we need to subject the laws that govern production and consumption to the laws of Gaia, the laws of the planet, the laws of a planet that can give forever in abundance for our needs if we do not allow the narrow-minded, mechanistic, reductionist, greed-based system of industrialism, capitalism, globalization to make us imagine that to be inhuman is the definition of being human.